Welcome to Politicking. I'm Larry King. New Jersey Senator Robert Menendez, a powerful Democrat on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, announced Tuesday that he will vote against the Obama administration's nuclear agreement with Iran. He joins fellow Democrat Senator Chuck Schumer of New York coming out against the deal. Where does this leave the White House? And how worried should supporters of the agreement be about other Democrats coming out in opposition? We'll talk about that with the Democratic Congressman John Yarmouth of Kentucky. He serves on the House Budget Committee, also on the House uh, Committee on Energy and Commerce. He has worked in the media as a journalist, editor, publisher, and commentator. Thanks for being with us, Congressman Yarmouth. Senator uh, Bob Menendez of New Jersey said that he's looked into his own soul and the principal says that he can't lead him to take this course. He says if Iran is to acquire a nuclear bomb, it cannot have his name on it. How badly does this hurt the chances of passage? Well, I don't think it really makes much difference, Larry, and it's good to be with you. I, I think that um, uh, Senator Menendez was one of those that uh, virtually everybody expected to oppose the deal. He has a constituency with a lot of Jewish members who, uh, a lot of Jewish constituents who are uh, putting pressure on him not to support the deal. Um, so I don't think it really makes much difference. I'm part of the group in the House that is um, whipping our membership to uh, be able to sustain a presidential veto of a resolution of disapproval of the deal. And so far, the only surprises we've had have been, from our perspective, favorable surprises. We've had nobody who's defected who we thought we could count on to uh, support the president's plan. Menendez says that it fails to stop Iran from becoming, from becoming a nuclear weapons state at, at the time of its choosing. How do you answer that? Well, um, in the third provision of the agreement, Iran uh, fully uh, commits to never getting an atomic uh, nuclear weapon. Uh, and there's an unprecedented uh, regimen of uh, inspection procedures that are in place and will be in place indefinitely. The, all the timelines that we hear about, the one year, the five year, the eight year, the 10 year, the 15 year, only relate to their civilian nuclear program, which, by the way, as signatories to the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, they have a right to have. Uh, so I, I don't understand that position. And, of course, the alternative is that if there is no deal, then they are literally months away from having enough uh, material to build a nuclear weapon. So I, I don't see it. I've never heard any of the opponents of this deal explain why, even if you say it after 15 years they could cheat and get a nuclear weapon, why that is not preferable to have them being a few months away from having a nuclear weapon. And what about this, I keep hearing this 45-day delay before you can check it out? Well, there's a provision in, in the agreement that if there is a, what is an undeclared site, so if the, the inspectors suspect that Iran is conducting some kind of nuclear activity uh, somewhere other than the facilities we know about, in other words, maybe on a, a kind of a conventional military facility, that we can, the inspectors can demand access to that facility. If Iran then refuses to allow access, there is a process which could take up to 24 days uh, which to allow inspectors in. Now, the scientists who have worked on this deal very extensively say, if you have nuclear activity at a site, you can't hide it uh, for 24 days. Or you, it, it lasts past 24 days, the evidence. So if they tried to do that, the inspectors ultimately would find out that they were trying to cheat, and that would back automatically snap the sanctions back into place. So, you know, I think everybody who's looked at this deal, who's been involved in in nuclear inspections, uh, nuclear nonproliferation agreements in the past, said this is unprecedented in its ability to detect any illicit activities that the Iranians might engage in. All right, Congressman. At the end of the day, is this going to be a deal done? I think there will be. I, I, I'm very confident that we have enough votes in the House to sustain a presidential veto. Uh, we had 151 members who signed a letter uh, supporting uh, di a diplomatic approach to the Iran nuclear program. Not one of them has uh, come out against the deal yet. 
And, uh, you know, we're talking to them virtually every day. So I'm pretty much confident we can hold on to the minimum of 146 members we would need to uh, sustain a presidential veto in the House. Now we'll move to some political things, Congressman. Sorry. When you spoke sure. with us last October, you said the Democratic nomination is Hillary's for the asking. Do you stand by that? Well, I still think she is an overwhelming favorite, and um, I, I, I don't think that um, any of the recent activities have really changed that that much. Clearly, if um, if a new entrant to the race uh, appeared, uh, if it were Joe Biden, that might change the equation a little bit. But I think if the cast of characters remains the way it is, that Hillary Clinton will still be our, our Democratic nominee. Do you think the email thing will come back to hurt her? Well, it's going to be something she has to deal with. But I think right now, the uh, assuming that there is no smoking gun in the emails and on the server that she just turned over, uh, I think what will happen is there's enough time that all of those emails can be examined. And the issue of whether she, in fact, knowingly transmitted uh, classified information will be resolved and it would be over with. Uh, so I, I think... If again, if if you take her for her word and she's accurate in that there were no classified information emails sent over her uh, private server, then uh, I think that'll it eventually will go away. If, uh, if 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 not, though, Larry, then she might have a, she'll have a problem yeah. if, if it turns out that what she said wasn't true. If Vice President Biden does get in, would it be difficult for you <laughs> to continue to support her? Uh, if Joe Biden got in the race, it would make it difficult for me and a lot of other people. Uh, I've known Joe Biden since I was a staffer on Capitol Hill when he came to the Senate in 1972. Um, he is a wonderful man. Um, he was a great friend of my former boss, uh, and uh, I have a great deal of personal affection for him. And I also have a great deal of respect of, for his ability. I think he would be a tremendous president. So, yeah, he'd put everybody in a tough spot if he gets in the race. What do you make of the Bernie Sanders phenomenon? Well, it's pretty interesting. I mean, I think it's hard to, to understand how people, anybody, any politician could be getting crowds of 20, 25,000. I mean, those, those are numbers that approach what uh, then uh, Senator Barack Obama was getting as a, as a candidate in his first term. I think what you're seeing right now is a lot of curiosity seekers, people who don't really know much about Bernie Sanders, see him as an outsider candidate the same way a lot of Republicans are seeing Donald Trump, and they're coming to check him out. I ultimately think that um, when, when uh, people compare the issues, and actually a lot of polling is done uh, comparing the um, chances of Hillary Clinton against Republican candidates and, and Bernie Sanders, that I think some of his luster will wear off. You know, I, have, I have a lot of respect for Bernie Sanders. I agree with him on, on a lot of issues. But ultimately, he's a, he's a crusader, and I'm not sure a crusader can be a president. Do you buy any of the buzz that Al Gore would get in? No, I, I really don't. I, don't uh, I, I, I just he he would have he has no organization. Uh, most people who uh, were active at that point have pretty much forgotten about who he is and and what he did, and uh, he obviously doesn't have the ability to go to Bill Clinton and uh, get his support. So I, I just can't see where. He, he would realistically think he had any kind of a chance. In 2008, Hillary cast herself as unabashedly pro-coal. She's now praising Obama's stricter rules on coal-fired power plants. Seems to talk about the coal industry in the past tense. Kentucky is coal country. Is that a problem for you? Well, not really. I've actually been a strong supporter of the president's activities and, and the new EPA power plant proposals. I do have some concerns about the, the finalized rule that was issued just a couple of weeks ago and its impact on Kentucky, and we're trying to figure that out, uh, working with the EPA and working with Kentucky's Energy Department. But in the, in the final analysis, I think uh, it's a plan that uh, will move the country forward and move it in the direction of uh, uh, sw switching from fossil-based fuels to uh, renewable energy and the uh, greater use of natural gas. I think that will be good for the environment. It'll be good for consumers. Uh, it'll be hard in the transition in Kentucky and the Kentucky coal fields, but they've been suffering for uh, decades now. And it's not because of EPA. They've been suffering because of changes in the market and also because uh, there's much cheaper coal and other sources of energy to be found elsewhere. It's basically just cost prohibitive right now to mine coal in eastern Kentucky. 
in Appalachia. So, you know, I think the coal industry is is a declining industry. We have, we've seen a number of coal companies uh, going into receivership, taking bankruptcy. It's a tough time for them and certainly a tough time for the miners. But I, I don't think any change in our federal policy is going to change the future for coal. I think their future is pretty bleak. About a month ago, you said you thought that Donald Trump might be the number one dumpster fire in the country. <laughs> what do you what do you make of of the Trump polling figures? Well, the way I look at it, um, they on a national basis, about 27, 28 percent of registered voters identify as Republicans. He has about a quarter of that, so that means he has seven or eight percent. Uh, of the country. So I don't see ultimately him as being a viable national candidate. What he's done is so dramatically impact the Republican field that it, it's almost impossible to say who's going to emerge once uh, the field uh, is winnowed down. And it, it will be clearly. Right now, it's basically Donald Trump and everybody else. That's not a good position for Jeb Bush or Mario Rubio or Marco Rubio or uh, Scott Walker or any of the other, other 16 candidates. Uh, he's a real problem for them. I don't think he's a problem for Democrats. How about your fellow Kentuckian, Rand Paul? Well, Rand has really suffered from this. Uh, as, again, most of them have, it's hard to get traction when uh, Donald Trump is getting 70, 80 percent of the coverage uh, of this campaign. And Rand has a really interesting message. There's some things that I agree strongly with him on. There are a lot of things I disagree with him on. But Rand is a different kind of candidate. And it's a shame that he's not getting any uh, any uh, media coverage because I, I still think he has a chance of being the nominee once the, a lot of this kind of initial uh, nonsense goes away. But <clears throat> clearly, Donald Trump has... has up, totally uh, upset the the Republican primary system, and uh, he could make it very, very difficult for a Republican to be competitive. According to Kentucky rules, as I understand it, Rand Paul couldn't run for president and re-election to the Senate on the same ballot. Could that be changed, or is that the standard rule? Well, that's the law in Kentucky. It's not the law in every state. As you know, Paul Ryan ran for vice president and re-election to the House uh, in 2012. But... Um, in Kentucky, it is law. You cannot be on the ballot for two separate offices. What he is trying to do, and it will be what Rand Paul's trying to do, and it will be decided this weekend, is to convince Kentucky Republicans to go to a caucus system similar to Iowa to make their their uh, to choose their delegates to the Republican convention and assign their and assign their delegates to the candidates. So to replace a primary, which means he would not be on the there would be no primary election for president. That would get him through the primary. But then if he became pre if, if he actually became the nominee, he would have a problem that he couldn't solve because he couldn't be on the ballot as both senator for both Senate and president. Um, he would have to withdraw as a, as a candidate for Senate. And in, by Kentucky law also, the party is not allowed under those circumstances to replace the candidate. So by default, uh, a Democrat would be elected to the Senate. So he's a it's a very difficult situation for Republicans in Kentucky, but it looks like uh, this weekend they're going to decide to go to a caucus system, which again would allow him to be, remain a candidate for president in Kentucky, but also be a candidate on the ballot uh, for uh, in, in the May primary of next year. Let's continue the conversation with Congressman John Yarmouth. I just made you a senator, Congressman, but I'm happy to promote you. <laughs> He's a Democrat. He serves on the House <laughs> Budget Committee, also the House Committee on Energy and Commerce, and he knows all about this because he's worked in the media as a journalist, editor, publisher, and commentator. Why did you leave that for this? <laughs> uh, it's a good question. I, <laughs> temporary insanity, I guess, is probably the best explanation. <laughs> I was, uh, I had the ideal life, and in 2005, I was had no intention at all of running in 2006. Uh, but then Jack Conway, whom I thought was, who's now running for governor of Kentucky, I thought was going to run for the seat. He decided not to. And I said, oh, no, that means that Ann Northup, who was then the incumbent, uh, would have a free pass. And I said, I'm the only one who can beat her. And if I can be one of the 15 seats that flips from Republican to Democrat and can thereby stop the uh, Bush agenda, that'll make it worthwhile. So that's really why I got into it initially. And here I am uh, five terms later. Back in March, you told the Young Professional Association of Louisville 
that Congress is a hopeless cause. You also said it's exactly as dysfunctional as it appears. <laughs> yes. Why? Well, I think uh, for the most part, we, and this is sound, going to sound like a cop out, and I don't really mean it as such, but the outside world makes it very, very difficult for Congress to do its job. Um, people have basically decided that compromise and give and take is something that's unacceptable, that shouldn't be part of the process. And so what we're getting is um, with Republicans in charge, and I guess to a certain extent when Democrats were in charge, we're getting very extreme measures of legislation. And uh, so they, the, the one party that's proposing legisl legislation makes it impossible for anybody on the other side to vote for it. Uh, and there's no willingness to compromise. And then the outside forces, such you know what I call the advocacy industries, it's on the right, the Heritage Foundation and Grover Norquist and, uh, and uh, Club for Growth and uh, all of those organizations. And then on the left, there's Move On and some others. And it's basically, if, if you deviate one foot from <clears throat> the, the party line or the ideological line, then they, you know, they say, they're gonna, we'll have a primary challenge against you. We won't give you any money and so forth. So they, the outside world's made it very, very, very difficult for us to act responsibly. <clears throat> I was part of the group last in the last Congress that worked on immigration reform, a group of eight. We met in, in secret every day for, eight, for seven months, and we actually did a lot of good compromising, a lot of give and take, horse trading. We came up with a proposal that we were convinced could pass both houses and be enacted. It never got to the floor of the House. But the only reason we were able to do it was we did it in, in secret. I would hate for us to have a, a Congress that can only function if it came up with plans in secret. But uh, right now, I think that's the only way it can happen. Are you the only Democrat in the Kentucky delegation? I am the only Democrat in the Kentucky delegation. It's is, a lonely place, but uh, scheduling the Democratic caucus meetings may, is very easy. Is that going to change anytime <laughs> soon? Um, you know, I think there's a chance we could we could win the the central Kentucky district that includes Lexington. Uh, that's a seat that Ben Chandler held not too long ago. And if Hal Rogers ever decides to retire from southeastern Kentucky, I think Democrats can win that seat. Uh, right now, it'll be interesting to see what happens in the Senate race next year with Rand Paul if he <clears throat> ends up still as a candidate for Senate as to whether this flirtation with the presidency and trying to have it both ways makes him a vulnerable candidate. But um, I'm not betting any time on getting a, a fellow Democrat in the delegation anytime soon. You played golf with the president earlier this summer. Did you beat him? Well, I beat him, but it was interesting. I, uh, we, we actually had a team match. I was partners with uh, Ed Perlmutter and Joe Courtney from Connecticut was partners with the president. And we actually lost the match, but won money because we pressed at the end additional bets and we won the last three holes. So huh. we beat him out of three dollars, even though ultimately that our team lost. I shot a better score than the president, but I'd, I'd better shoot a better score than the president because I have a much lower handicap. But he's a pretty good player. And I'll tell you, it was a joy to be with him. Uh, he loves the game. It, it was all fun. It was just like, a, with the exception of Secret Service in the woods and everything, uh, <laughs> it was just like a normal day out with your buddies. He is a, he's a real pleasure to be with. And so are you. Great talking with you, Congressman. Thanks, Larry. Good to be with you, as always. Congressman John Yarmouth, Democrat of Kentucky.